Lord Jesus. There were people at that time of life that we didn't like. There were people we were angry with. There were people who hurt us. There were people we resented. Help us to remember so that we can forgive. Oh, Lord, we are taught to pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Some of us here have not forgiven, and that is why our bodies have not forgiven us. That is not the reason in every case, but in some cases it is the reason. Our bodies are not prospering because our souls are not sufficiently prospering. Because too much we have denied, and too much we have refused to look, and perhaps we were right when we could not do anything about it, to refuse to look. But now, we are here together to help each other. In every meeting together, in our prayer group, in our friendship, in all the lectures. Therefore, if we don't believe there is enough power now to do it, that's just too bad. Because there is. <laughs> so therefore, Lord, help us to remember and help us to make an act of forgiveness. Help us to definitely make this decision, looking back now. Even if the person who riled us the most at that time is no longer upon this earth, nevertheless, give us the grace to go to Jesus and say, Oh, Lord Jesus, please tell my father or my mother or my school principal or my boss or whoever it was that I'm sorry that I've resented this so long and that I forgive and that I want to be forgiven. We give thanks, O Lord, believing. It is the will of thy Holy Spirit to sweep in you over our souls, and therefore we better sweep out this trash out of his way. So help us now, Lord, to do so. Continue to pour out thy healing power upon those whom we lift up before thee, those for whom we have decided to pray as a special intention. And now I lift up before thee another special intention. A young lad, George, 18 years old, who has just written to this place asking prayer, or his mother or someone has, because of terrible pain in the back, five discs out of place, faced with an operation, but in great pain. I know, Lord, that if the way is sufficiently open, if the channel here is sufficiently open, I know that it is possible that thy healing power may touch this lad, George, and that his discs will go back into place and his spine will be healed even without an operation. I know this. If the channel that we make is still too clogged for this, then at least I know that thy power can get through our channel enough to take away the pain and bless the surgeons and cause the operation to be brilliantly successful. And so by faith I see this thy power now, touching this land. And all of a sudden, the pain easing, and all of a sudden, comfort and strength coming into him. And then I look ahead by faith and see the spine well. And I give thee thanks for this, O Lord, believing that it shall be so. To Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This request just came in for George, and at the same time, uh, John just showed me a letter from his wife. Just before he left home, I asked his permission to tell this story because it fits in here. Just before he left home, he prayed for a policeman in the town, his name I forget, not particularly a church man, who was terribly afflicted with blinding headaches due to a tumor within the head. Just before he left home, he prayed for the man. His wife, Paula, writes to him now to say that the doctors uh, opened the head and looked in and there wasn't any tumor, it's gone. So thank the Lord. So thank the Lord. Now, the two things that clog our channels the most, because you see, God does use us as channels. Just, I sometimes wish he wouldn't, but he just does. And sometimes our channels are not big enough, and sometimes they are fairly well blocked. And one mistake that we very often make is to try to 
undertake too great a prayer project when we ourselves as channels uh, cannot conduct enough power. One time I was putting on a Christmas pageant and I had a thousand watt floodlight that I was going to shine on my beautiful Christmas angels as I described in the last chapter of Lost Shepherd. That's the true story about that pageant. And I went to plug it in and my young electrician leaped in the air. He said, what are you trying to do? Burn down the church? I said, well, I, I've got these floodlights. So I've got to plug them in. He said, you can't plug a thousand-watt floodlight into an ordinary channel. He said, either it'll blow out every fuse in the place or it'll burn down the church. Now, you know, you hear people say the opposite. I don't care. I'm here to tell you what I believe. You can take it or leave it. You hear people say that anybody can at any time pray for anything, no matter how big, and clap their heels and run off and forget it, and God will do it. Now, <laughs> I wish that was true, but in my years of experience, I've not found that to be true. No. We first of all need to seek guidance what to pray for. And then we need to say, Lord, prepare me. Am I big enough? And if we're not big enough, what can we do about it? Well, I said to the electrician, I said, but I've got to have these floodlights. So build me a bigger channel. And he did, and I did. We don't have to give up if our channel is big enough. We have to work toward increasing our channel. Now, as some of you have read in my little book, Let's Believe, one time I taught this to children in a daily vacation Bible school, and believe me, those little children really learned to pray. And they did some miracles. Amazing, some amazing miracles and some real cute little miracles because they were so tiny and so sweet and yet so real, you know. Like the little boy that was afraid of dogs and he said, I asked God to make me not be afraid of dogs and this great big old dog came out barking at me and I, I said to him, I said, uh, God made you and God made me and I like you all right, so I expect you like me pretty soon. <laughs> and he said he stopped barking right away, and he wagged his tail, and he came up, and he was just as nice as anything. <laughs> and there were some big ones, too, some real life-changing miracles. But we studied, and I taught those children uh, more inexorably than I often dare to teach grown people. But I'm tired of pussyf pussyfooting around now, so I'm going to tell you. First of all, we studied together what things were right to pray for. We decided that you could not pray for a thing that would hurt anybody else. You can't say, oh, Lord, help me succeed in business and run my uh, competitor out of business, you know. Can't do that. I said to the children, told them about a cartoon of a little boy kneeling down by the bed, and he said, oh, Lord, make me a good boy and help me beat up Butch in the morning. And I said, is that a good kind of prayer? No, you can't pray that. Now, dear friends, in Old Testament times, people did pray just things like that. But Jesus hadn't come then, and they didn't see all of God. They only saw the outer fringes of his glory, as is told in that wonderful story, you know, about Elijah in the cave, and he saw the outer fringes of his glory. They saw his power, but they didn't see his love. And since Jesus has come and we see his love, you can no more say, make me be a good boy and help me beat up foot. And I said to the children, can you say, make me a, uh, make me a good boy and help my gang beat up Butch's gang? No, they said that's the same thing. I said, can you say, make me a good boy and help my country beat up Germany? This was during the war. That took a bit of thinking. But finally they said, no. If you've got to do it, you've got to do it. But you can't ask God to help you. Now, that's an advance from Old Testament days, when they called on God quite gleefully and cheerfully to help them smite their enemies hip and thigh and so on. Well, praise God, we do it then. The race changes, the race grows up, Jesus comes into the race and becomes part of us, and the power of God works through us in different ways. So we talked, we learned that, we studied that, we studied what was sensible to pray for and what wasn't. And they had a lot more sense than some grown people I know, too. We, I held up an apple and a potato, and I said, now, children, if you were planting apples, could you pray for God to bless your apples? And make them good, and they thought a while, and then they said, yeah, yes, you could. And that's true. The Bible is full of prayers for God to bless the earth and the flocks and the herds and the trees and so on. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow, as Tommy asked me to do. And, uh, <laughs> yes, I <thank you>, Tom. 
So I said if you were a farmer and planted potatoes, could you ask God to bless your potatoes and help them be good? Yes, but yes, you could. I said, well, now, look, kid, can you ask God, can you pray for God to make your apple trees grow potatoes on them? And he said, no. And I said, well, why not? But well, she said, God can do anything. They said, yeah, but God doesn't do things that are silly. <laughs> well, okay, that's good enough. Amen. He doesn't do things that are silly. And so we need to consider sometimes, is this silly or not? Is this within the bounds of the power of God, or is it not? Now, I know that the mending of George's discs and his spine, that's not silly. That's within the bounds of God's power. If George had had a leg cut off, I'm afraid I wouldn't dare say pray for God to grow him a new leg, even though it might be possible a thousand years from now. Quite frankly, I would know that I did not at this time have faith enough to pray for a thing that big. I just have to recognize my limitations. Now, people say you're limiting God. Oh, no, I'm not. God has placed himself strangely, but he has limited himself in a sense by giving man free will. And that's his game. And as for the reason why, you ask me why God did that, the answer is very simple. The answer is, I don't know. But one of these days, when we become the sons of God, maybe I will know. Maybe I'll say, oh, yes, Lord, I see now why you did it. <laughs> we never would have grown up if you'd just done anything and everything through us at all times. And we just had to grow up. Maybe, maybe it will be like that. Well, anyway, to get back to my story, we went out in the yard, the kids and I, and I said to them, and we dug a trench, and then we dug a hole at the bottom of the trench. And then I got a can of some water. And I said to the children now, if I pour this water into this trench, is it going to go down into the hole, or is it going to go out at the two sides, or is it going to go uphill? They said, it'll go down into the hole. I said, are you sure? Oh, yeah. I said, how, why? How do you know? They said, because of the law of gravity. You can't break the law of gravity. Rufus uh, Jones said, you, if you step off a cliff, you don't break the law of gravity. You illustrate it. <laughs> so then I, we got some little stones, and we built a dam across. And I poured the water into the little trench. And it ran down to the dam, and then it went out on both sides. It did not get down into the hole, except just a few drops did. I said to the children, what's happened? I thought you told me it had to go down in the hole. Have we broken the law of gravity? They said, no, you put something in the way. All right, that's it. Now, I said, when you ask God to come into your life and do a thing that you've decided is kind and sensible, like healing your mother of his head uh, her headaches and helping your father to get a new job and helping you learn your arithmetic and not be afraid of dogs, and if nothing happens, I said, is it because God's not doing it? I said, the way God answers that prayer is to send himself into that person or dog or whatever. And God is love. So I said, God sends his power by a law called the law of love. And it's just as sure as the law of gravity. So I said, suppose you pray and you give it time and you keep on praying and still nothing happens. What's wrong? Have you broken the law of love? Children said, No. I guess we put something in the way. I said, okay, what could you put in the way now? Figure it out. And the children said, well, I guess being mad with people. Or I guess being mean to people. Okay. There it is. Now, you know, there's one trouble with Christians, among a few others perhaps. <laughs> but we are so apt to put on a mask. And we say, oh, I love everybody. <laughs> you know, there's only one kind of person that I can't do a thing for, and that's the one that comes up to me and says, oh, I love everybody. <laughs> I have no enemies. And the worst of it is, she doesn't know that she's only lying in her teeth. Like as not, she doesn't know it. And how do I know this to tell you this? Because I've been this way myself. That's how we learn all that we learn. Even after I was praying for people and trying to heal people and so on and so forth, even long after that, as I went back through my memories, the way I'm asking you to do, you see, the Holy Spirit showed me people that I'd forgotten 
that I hated those people. I didn't know that there was still in me a resentment toward those people. I didn't know. And as the Holy Spirit showed me, then I could forgive. One of those people was the one I called Mr. Bly in my book, The Second Mrs. Wu, which I've told you is a true story of my own life. So if you read the book, you will perceive that the little girl in the book, who was me, felt a deep and bitter resentment toward this man, a good man, but narrow-minded, because he had been rather cruel, standing on principles and all, not meaning to be cruel, but still he had been rather cruel to her father. And it caused her father great pain and distress. Now, dear friends, until I wrote that book, I didn't know that I was still angry deep down inside. Not the grown-up woman, but you see, the little girl ten years old who was still living in me. I didn't know that that little girl ten years old hadn't yet forgiven the man whom I called Mr. Bly. I didn't know it. And now here is a marvelous thing. God works so wonderfully through creative action. I'm so happy that some of you people like to paint and to uh, make music and to teach and to do things like that because God can work through those things. And it was through writing that book that I not only forgave Mr. Bly, but quite fell in love with him. Now, you read the book and see what a sweet person he turned out to be. I'm, I confess I did foreshorten that. I mean, I put in the book something that actually didn't happen until years later. It did happen, but not until years later. And that was the change in the little girl's mind. But the point I'm trying to bring out is, I didn't know that that was down there. Now, don't be frightened and upset when I tell you that there are things down in you. How do I know there are? Well, if you want to know the truth, because some of you here... Well, you're still going around with some colitis and different kinds of itises and whatnot, you should be well by this time. That's how I know. Now, I don't say that every single serious difficulty should be well by this time, as I have told you. There are some things which I feel right now, I, I, I am not sure that our faith is enough. So that I do not mean. I don't mean to say that at all. But I do mean that I perceive that there are among you ones who by this time should be recovered of these small minor difficulties. Now, where do these small, minor difficulties come from? Inside of you. Your own inner being condemning you. For a good reason. Not because it hates you, not because the Holy Spirit hates you, but because your unconscious is trying to say to you, through your body, is trying to say to you, look, sister, loosen up. <laughs> There's something else down in here that you haven't seen. Let me show it to you. You see? Now, that's not the only reason, dear friend. Sometimes it's because you're too good and you work too hard. Sometimes it's because your sons and daughters-in-law and grandchildren are such a pain in the neck and you're trying so hard to deal with them. <laughs> so I'm not saying this is the only reason, but I am saying this is one reason, and I see it just as clearly as can be. Maybe even with some of you between you and somebody else here. <laughs> Maybe between you and somebody on the council ring might be me who doesn't do enough for you that you think you ought to have. Now, from the human view, point of view, it's quite natural to feel like this, but as Tommy has pointed out to us, we, we're not just human. And we're not supposed to be, praise God. Because we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and his promise and his intention is to come into us and conform us into his own image. And he was able to carry out this forgiveness even upon the cross. Now, that does not mean that he never saw when people are doing wrong. It does not mean that he did not at times tell them and warn them. He told the Pharisees, he told them plenty. But it does mean that he did not in himself hold any resentment or any unforgiveness or any bitterness. Now, nobody has been as mean to you as they were to him. Well, somebody isn't as nice to you as they might have been or wasn't a long time ago. Nobody's ever been as mean to you as they were to Jesus. And have they? And so that is why. Today, as I ask you to go back to the mid-portion of your life, I have the feeling that in this part of your life, if you will look, you will find roots of bitterness, 
roots of bitterness that grow up into all kinds of nervous and physical ills. But more than that, roots of bitterness that are like little stones that partly clog the channel. Now, not completely, praise the Lord, not completely. Thank God. But partly. So therefore, if we want, as we do want, more of his power coming in, that is why I plead with you by the mercies of Jesus to take this seriously, because this nobody can do for you. Either you forgive or you do not forgive. So let us make that our assignment tonight. It's fun to do when you want to see it. When I wrote the book, The Second Mrs. Wu, why, that was the most fun in the world. Why, I went back how many years? Over 50 years, you see. And lived the life of that little girl over again and saw what things were wrong by the grace of God. And <laughs> through writing the book, that the So now. As we work toward this, we are working toward the very thing that Tommy talked about this morning and that I talked about last night. We are clearing the way for what we long for and expect and dream about, and that is that the Holy Spirit, while we are here together, shall sweep over our souls in a new way. We are clearing the way. Now, my approach to this whole matter of receiving the Holy Spirit is a little bit different from Tommy's, and that's fine. You may have noticed that Tommy and I are a little different in some ways. (laughs) I can't quite come up to Tommy, but anyhow... Uh, God made us all different. And as I was studying on this and thinking why and how come, it occurred to me that a whole lot of this, it's different from John, too, a whole lot of this is because I'm just a woman and I'm just a lay person, and both of them are ministers. And I'll tell you why, how that makes it just a little bit different. Well, I think I'd better back up a little bit. I'll come to this presently, but I'm going a little too fast. I think I'll backtrack a little bit and tell you first about the preparation that I believe is wise. Now, I won't say necessary, but I do say wise for receiving the Holy Spirit. I don't say necessary because some people receive a great baptism or outpouring of the Spirit uh, when they're not really particularly prepared at all and when they've still got all their little problems inside of them and when their memories are still clogged up with bitternesses and so on and so forth, and sometimes that works out all right, because the Holy Spirit, after all, is the sanctifier, and any time that it is His will and God's will for the Holy Spirit to sleep over our souls, we praise God and thank Him, whether we have made complete preparation or not, because it may work out perfectly all right, but it will work out with more difficulty, I do assure you. And with some people, it does not work out too well at all. And I know because they're the ones that come to me and tell me about it. And sometimes they say, Agnes, somebody prayed for me to to speak in tongues. That's what they say. Of course, I know what they mean is they prayed for the baptism of the Spirit. But they, all they got was speaking in tongues. That's all they got. And they will say, and you know, I did. But you know, I'm still unhappy inside. Sometimes they say, I feel more unhappy. Sometimes they say, it's gotten, it's gotten worse. Why? I can tell you why. And it's very simple when you want to see it. The reason is that here they are with these unforgivenesses, as I have told you, and more and all kinds of other problems in their unconscious, you see, and they are not ready. They are not cleansed. They have not made sufficient preparation for this holy gift. Now, as I've told you, sometimes it works out all right, so don't worry. But other times it doesn't work out all right, so you may consider these two bits of warning that I'm giving you. One of them is, I really think, on the lo- in the long run, it is much better if we first do what the disciples did, what those who waited for the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, what they did, as Tommy told us so beautifully this morning. They had made preparation. They already knew Jesus and loved him. They already did their very best to forgive their enemies. They repented and confessed and turned unto the Lord. And those are the directions given in the Bible. First of all, to repent, that is to see what things in us need to be corrected and decide to correct them and begin on that job of correcting them. Praise God we don't have to finish or we never would get there, any of us, because it seems to be a never-ending job while we're in this world. But to begin. And the disciples had done that. You see, if we do not do that, sometimes it works out all right 
The Holy Spirit grabs a hold of us and straightens us out anyhow. But at other times, what can happen, why some people lose the joy, and occasionally even, someone becomes emotionally disturbed. Yes, that is true, and you've heard of such cases. You've occasionally even heard of somebody that blew their top and went entirely nuts. Now, that's not the fault of the Holy Spirit. Not at all. The Holy Spirit is a tremendous power. And it's the fault of trying to plug in a thousand-watt floodlight into an ordinary outlet. It's the lack in human wisdom. It's the lack in preparation for the Holy Spirit. It's very wrong of us to say, and Tommy mentioned this this morning, too, it's, it's, it's rather stupid of us to say, well, I don't want the Holy Ghost because I knew somebody that got that power, and oh, dear, they got so queer, and oh, they had such troubles. That's uh, it's rather natural, but it's a lack of understanding on our part. The troubles were not the fault of the Holy Spirit, but they were the fault of human preparation. So I myself feel that it is much better if we make that preparation, and here again, do not be discouraged, because you've been doing it ever since you came to this place, haven't you? Why, well, certainly you have. Yes. Yeah. Certainly you have. And I believe that that preparation will increase in intensity and in power until your, the mention of your soul is cleansed sufficiently so that the Holy Spirit can come in without too much disruption. You see, what can happen if a person gets a momentary, you might say, tremendous stimulation on the surface of the mind and the unconscious is not cleansed and their problems are still upon them and they're still tied up in hates and resentments and fears and so on, what can happen, praise God, it isn't very often, but once in a while it can happen, is that it increases the strain. Here's the spirit flying up in the sky, and here's the poor old uh, inner being, you know, still struggling along. It increases the tension. Now, that is why we prepare, and we are preparing, and you are preparing, so do not despair at this, but just consider. And consider this also... Whenever you are moved or guided to pray for someone else to receive the Holy Spirit. I told you in my first lecture here about a young minister at the School of Pastoral Care who had a wonderful, oh, a marvelous uh, spiritual experience of remembering the time of his birth, and remembering a conversation there between his father and his mother, getting the key to the lifelong resentment of father toward him, him toward father, and being able, even though the Father had gone into the heavens, being able in a vision to accomplish a forgiveness. Now, this young man also told, which I had forgotten, that a year previously he had come to me at some conference and asked me to pray for him to receive the baptism of the Spirit, and I had refused, because I said, you're not ready. I said, there are other things that always need to be prayed for first. I said, I'd rather pray for the healing of the memories. I said, tell me a little bit about yourself and about your life, all of which I had forgotten. But this young man said, I am so glad. It would never have worked the other way. He said, we prayed together for the healing of the memories, for the cleansing of the soul, the healing of the soul. The healing of the memories, as I like to call it, is you could call it the healing of the soul. Therefore, when? Not too long after that. In fact, I think very soon after that. Someone prayed for him to receive the baptism, he was ready. And therefore he received it with joy, and it led toward this other great experience, and where it will lead from then on in, I don't know. Maybe you'll see him up here someday. I won't tell you who he is, but maybe you will. He's not this one here. He's not anyone you know. But maybe you will one of these days, because there's a person with tremendous power. So then, I believe, that it is far better, I do not say necessary, but I do say far better, to take the preliminary steps of cleaning house within ourselves. After all, if you invite a distinguished guest to come to your home, if you like, you can bring him in with all the dirt on the floor and the unwashed dishes and the beds unmade, okay, if you want to. But you have to have a much happier visit if you clean house first. So that is my first suggestion. Another suggestion that I have, and this may not apply to either Tommy or John, but I'm going to say it because I'm just a lay person, and with us it does apply. And that is, why and for what purpose do we desire the Holy Spirit? Now, the Holy Spirit is the power of God through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. 
The Holy Ghost is also the love of God and the joy of God. But all of these are bound up in the power of God. The Holy Spirit is a tremendous power. If you really receive a baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's like touching a, a, a very powerful current of electricity. Okay, what are you going to do with it? Now, with a minister, there's no problem. Because they are ministers, and because their whole life work, you see, makes an open channel for this power. There they are with all these people to evangelize, to save, to convert, to heal, to comfort, and so on and so forth. In other words, the channel is already prepared. Before they hook up to the outlet, the channel for the power is already prepared. So for them, that's no problem. But how about you and me? Some of what I do is what I'm doing now, teaching and lecturing. Some of it is cooking, keeping house. Some of it is trying to be a good grandmother and, and mother. Some of it is writing books. Okay, what am I going to do with this power when it hits me? I feel that this is a very important point to decide. Because if the power enters into us and has no place to go, it can backfire on us. It can disturb us in one way or another way. I was in a prayer group one time at a conference where some of them had the gift of the Spirit and some did not. And a young man there suddenly received the baptism of the Spirit. No one act at the time, no one actually was praying for him to receive. But we were in general prayer, and the, he just did. And he began to speak in tongues, and he began to shake and <laughs> quiver and sort of get emotionally upset. Now, dear friends, that's not good. I mean, getting emotionally upset and shaking and quivering and that type of thing is just not too good. It's disturbing to the psyche. But the power is good, praise God. And so I said to the young man, here, yeah, you're getting too stimulated. Turn around and put your hands on so-and-so who needs the healing for his ears. Turn right around now and put your hands on his ears and immediately pray for the gift of healing and let the power flow through you in this channel of healing. So he did. And as the power had somewhere to go, now this sounds very childish, but I am kind of childish. As the power had someplace to go, you see, then he wasn't all torn apart with it. Then he quieted down, and he was all right. He kept the power. He kept the gift of tongues. He also kept the gift of healing. He immediately transformed it from a, a, a spiritual experience into an act, into an active flow of energy. Now, that's exactly what the disciples did on Pentecost. We were talking yesterday about Pentecost, do you remember? Now, after Pentecost, do you read anywhere in the Bible? where they said to each other, oh, let's get together and speak in tongues some more. What a wonderful spiritual experience. <laughs> now, I don't doubt that they did, of course, continue in these gifts, but it was so small and so minor a part of their Christian activity that it is not reported. You don't read that. What do you read? It was immediately transformed into power. Primarily the power to heal. Read the book of Acts and see these amazing healings. Now, they had done healing before, praise God. That's why they were prepared to receive so much power, because they'd already been doing these things. They'd already been doing them. But the power added strength to strength and added more of the power of the Lord Jesus to the power that they already had, you see. And so after the day of Pentecost, you will see if you read the book that the power was tremendously increased, the power to heal, the power to convert. Now, as you read on the book of Acts, you will see a perfectly marvelous power in their own bodies to survive all kinds of things. You remember, St. Paul was shipwrecked and floated in the deep a day and a night and so on and so forth and didn't bother him a bit. Picked up a snake and he just shook it off in the fire, did him no harm. I don't know what his thorn in the flesh was, and people say to me, what about St. Paul's thorn in the flesh? I say, well, what about it? I got two or three myself. <laughs> But whatever it was, it did not stop him from doing the Lord's work, not at all. And it was partially healed, but not completely. And the Lord said, I'll send you some more healing every day. Every day my grace will be sufficient for you, because my strength will be made perfect in weakness. Later on in his life, it may have been, or may not, I don't know. 
Some think it was his eyesight. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Here were these tremendous miracles. You remember the time when he preached too long? Which I'll try not to do. And the young man fell out of the window and broke his neck and died. And St. Paul ran downstairs and grabbed him up and healed him and resurrected him and brought him back to life and said, Now, come on back upstairs. I'll finish my sermon. <laughs> So here was this flow of power of the Holy Spirit that quickened and awakened in them powers and gifts that they already had. You know, I really believe we are born with a spark of the Spirit of God inside us. I really believe that the Holy Spirit does not impose on us something entirely different from our natures, but quickens and brings forth in us. You reckon that's true, Tommy? It says so. Okay. Quickens and brings forth in us gifts that we already have. They're already potential to our nature. Now, as I mentioned before, people used to think, well, the gift of tongues is not in that category, you know. They think you're either you were nuts or else it was just pure, completely not understandable magic. But now, through our increased understanding of psychology, people who do understand know what it is. You're speaking from the spirit rather than from the mind, that's all. Therefore, and that's, potent, that's in your nature anyway. Therefore, you're talking to God in a more direct way. Adam and Eve did that. I don't know what language they spoke, but they talked to God in a more direct way. And you're talking to God in a more direct way. And that's why St. Paul said, He that speaketh with tongues speaketh unto God. And that's why he also said, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than ye all. Even though he did give warnings about not upsetting people by this and not doing it in a public meeting and having things done decently and in order. And even though he didn't stand up and mention it in sermons, Tommy said that too, and that's perfectly true. I've searched the scriptures too. I don't find any place where any of them said to people, you must speak in tongues. It was something that just spontaneously came when it spontaneously came to the glory of our Lord Jesus, to the comfort of those people who received these gifts. But even that gift is already potentially inside of us it's like a little fire that's lit in there, but it's burning so low it doesn't make any light, doesn't make any flame, and the Holy Spirit breathes upon it. You know, on the day of Pentecost, first there was the breath, the rushing mighty wind, and then there was the fire that came upon them. One time I had a little bellows and I was squirting cold air on my fireplace in Alstead, in the country there, where there was some smoldering coal, a uh, coal, and the cold air lit the coals and they burst into flame. <laughs> well, maybe that's the way it was on the day of Pentecost. The moving of the energy of God in the air quickened into a holy fire that illumined something within all of those who were present so that they became transformed personalities. Now, they had gone through long preparation. They had followed Jesus. They had lived with him. They had done his works the best that they could. They had conformed to his being of love the best that they could. So then, being prepared, when the power came, it was instantaneous. And this transformation in personality was instantaneous. Well then, a question does arise for those of us who are not, by profession, ministers or evangelists. And I've often run into this. I've seen people who, when they receive this gift of holy heavenly power, <laughs> all of a sudden they get to be no good in their in their work. They now this is not everybody, and this shouldn't be this way, and this is not going to be the way this way with us. But I will mention that I have known it to be. And sometimes people have come to me and they say, "Oh, I'm just not interested in my business anymore. Oh, I just like to give up and uh, give all of that up and go and tell everybody about speaking in tongues." Well, incidentally, they make a perfect nuisance of themselves. And they fail to support their wife and their family. And I, I, I'm keeping telling actual incidents, things I have known to happen. And it's a very poor testimony to the Holy Spirit. Now, if we remember that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, and if we remember the Spirit of God through Jesus Christ. And if you remember that God the Father is a creator, then I don't think we will fall into such danger as this. As somebody said, there's no use in man trying to be more spiritual than God is. 
As somebody else said, God is not primarily interested in religion. God is primarily interested in creation. Now, look, whether you like it or not, that's the truth. You read the Bible, you study history and prehistory and anthropology and all that thing. Before there were any heavy human beings to say prayers to him, God was primarily, delightedly, fascinatedly interested in creation. Now, that's the nature of God. To build, to create, to make. Why? I don't know. But he's like that. The more I study, and I do keep up with all of the, all that I can, of the modern findings of science and astronomy and so forth, the more I'm absolutely amazed that the tremendous creator that God the Father is. Why, well, we used to think this little earth was the center of the universe and the sun went around it and all like that. We got over that a long time ago, but still we thought that our galaxy, that's what you see when you look at the sky at night, and you see those millions and billions of stars, and you see the Milky Way, and you do know, don't you, that the Milky Way is actually billions of stars so far away that you can't see them. It just makes a little hazy appearance. You know that, don't you? And you know, don't you, the, the shape of our galaxy, something like a dinner plate, and our little Earth does happen to be very near the center of this roughly formed dinner plate, shall we say, so that when we look out to this side and this side, we see comparatively few stars. But when we look at what would be the edge of the dinner plate, then we see what we call the Milky Way, and that's billions of stars. And they are so far away, oh, it's unbelievable. Light travels at 186,000 miles a second. They are so far away that if somebody lived on one of them and could see this Earth in that bit of light, they'd see Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Because it would take thousands... I believe they say sometimes millions of years for light traveling at 186,000 miles a second to get from some of the stars in our own galaxy to this earth. But even to know that is a very limited understanding of the universe because now we know that our galaxy is not the whole universe. We used to think that the nebulae were little bunches of flaming gas. Well, one or two of them are where stars have exploded. You know... Creation continues. Stars live their life and eventually die. They either explode or they get dim and faint and disappear and lose their light. And they are dark stars, black wandering stars and that have lost all their light. And new stars are born. God is such a tremendous creator, he just can't stop creating. He loves it. <laughs> and the fun of it is, he's made us that way too, which I'll get to in just a minute. So now we know that many of these nebulae are not just little bits of flaming gas, but that they are other galaxies, other what we used to call universes. And now they tell us that not only do all of these stars have their orbits, not only that, but that every created heavenly body, in addition to that, is rushing forward through space at a speed of almost the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second, away from the central point. Ah! You remember this in Revelation that said, And I beheld a great white throne, and him that sat upon it, from whose face earth and heaven fled away? Hmm. The Holy Spirit revealed to some of those people who wrote the Bible things that science is just beginning to find out. We know what's in that central place where they can't see anything done. And God's creative energy is such that as he continually creates, Everything rushes forward. Now, God is the creator. Therefore, when the Holy Spirit of God comes into us and the nature of God enters into us, is it just going to make us good but static? No. God is not interested in people being good but static. As Confucius said, footprints on the sands of time are not made by sitting down. I don't, he didn't really say that, of course. <laughs> Just one of those silly remarks. <laughs> but the nature of God is such that as the Holy Spirit enters into us, we are impelled, whether we know it or not, into action. And if we do not know what it is that's bugging us or eating on us and driving us and impelling us, then we can just get all shook up, you see. 
It's because we've received into us more of the power of God, and that power of God wants us to do something. Now, what does that power of God want us to do? God made us in his own image and after his own likeness. Not that we are all exactly like him. I do know the shade of difference. <laughs> but that each one of us reflects a little bit of him. A little bit of his creativity is in every one of us. But we are all different. There are parables in the Bible explaining this. God gave to one ten talents, to another five, to another one, and so on. God makes no pretense of being fair. <laughs> In what we consider fairness, it's more fun just to be a creator. The idea that we have of standardization, everybody should be just alike, that just doesn't interest God the least bit in the world. You won't find that anywhere at all in the universe. You'll find instead this immense diversity. And after all, I think he's right sensible. Why, it's sort of like a stained glass window. If every piece of glass in the window was the same size and the same color, where would you have any picture? God is thinking of the final picture, you see. We can't see the final picture. If we could see the final picture, then I think we would understand. And we wouldn't complain if we think he's not there. He's fair. He is fair in a greater way than we can see. And in the long run, we'll know it, you see. But right now, however, he has given to all of us varying abilities. Now, to preachers and evangelists, he has called them to be preachers and evangelists. So it's no problem with them. The Holy Spirit coming into them is going to make them better preachers and evangelists. But now with us, some of us he's called to be school teachers. Some of us he's called to be homemakers. Some of us he's called to be businessmen. Now what are we supposed to now? What are we supposed to do? When we receive a baptism of the Holy Spirit, are we supposed to separate ourselves from our husband think, saying, Oh, he's just not spiritual? I tell him again and again he should be like I am, but he just won't. <laughs> Are we supposed to neglect our homes and be always running around the world telling people they should speak with tongues while the dishes pile up and everything gets messy and the children grow up in the middle of a mess and turn against God because Mama got the Holy Spirit and she's been no good ever since? <laughs> Are we supposed to neglect our business and let it go to seed? Because it's more important to be out preaching and testifying and all that. Now, this is a little more of a problem. And yet, I got this wonderful idea. It's the way I've always felt. But I read it this also in Pierre Teilhard de Chardin's work. God is the creator. God made man in his own image and likeness. And that is, God put little bits of his creativity into us. God put us on this little earth. And he said to man, now, have dominion. Here it is. See what you can do with it. And this great scientist, who is also a most holy man and a Jesuit priest, said that his belief was that God was fascinatedly interested in the work of our hands. You remember the commandment, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. God never said to people, pray the whole, heart, whole time. He never said that. That God is just delighted to see what we're doing down here. He's interested in our bridges. He's interested in our new building. He's interested in our new inventions. Like a father watching his children and saying, Oh, look what he's doing now. Isn't that fun? Now this I absolutely believe, and this I know for sure. And I know that those of us who are increased in the power of the Holy Spirit should take the channel that's prepared, no matter what it is, whether it's preaching or teaching or business, or running a home, or whatever it is, and turn the power into that channel. Yes, there'll be other little channels, too. But that main channel of our creative action. And you know, when that is done, they are the most glorious victories of the Spirit. Perfectly marvelous. I know a businessman, a very wealthy man indeed, who owns a factory. In fact, well, he has interest in factories all over the world. I know about his main factory, where he himself lives, and so on and so forth. It makes some kind of thing that's used in um, atomic energy, not for destruction, but in some fashion. He has received the power of the Holy Spirit, and he's turned it right straight away into his factory. He's got him a prayer group among the other men who work in the factory, both in the workshop and in the administrative offices and so on and so forth. No man is hired except by prayer. No man is fired except with prayer and with counseling and with love. 
Every day begins with prayer. And people come into that factory and they say, Oh, what, what have you got here? Why, I've never been in a place like this. Why, it doesn't feel like a factory. It feels like a church. This man says he has only one problem that is quite serious, and that is that his profits double and treble in a way that's embarrassing. He said he rather hoped in the month of December there was apt act to be a slack front uh, that they would uh, uh, not increase so much. But even in the month of December, why, well, they doubled. So now he's got another project. In that place, they train up men, not only in the work they do there, whatever it is, but they train them up in the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. These men receive the baptism of the Spirit, and then they plant them in other factories. All over the world. They just plant them there. And the real purpose why they're put there is for the purpose of prayer. Injustices are ironed out. Racial discriminations are corrected. Dishonesty is replaced with honesty. And the power of God gently sweeps through that factory. And nobody knows why or how. But this man that begins in a lowly position is usually promoted and is usually promoted. Now, don't you see how wonderful it is to give God not only our hearts but our businesses? Because then what we are doing is we are bringing God into this world. We're giving the business to God, actually. This man I told you about, he gave the business to God. Which didn't mean that he stayed off someplace praying and didn't tend to it. It meant that he gave himself and all of his abilities and all of his powers and all of his businesses and all of his factories to God. Now, some people say so, you know. They print a little folder uh, or something. He finds that he'd rather work in secrecy. He doesn't say so. He's a very shy man, actually. He doesn't say so. He doesn't have to advertise it as such. It just is such. I know school teachers, and I'm sure you do, who carry this power into their school teaching. Oh, I know one young woman who received the baptism of the Spirit with a tremendous overflow of gifts. She's married now, but she was teaching then a class of subnormal children. Uh, many of them couldn't hardly half speak. And she would pray for them every day and pour the power of the Holy Spirit into her classroom. And very often she'd pray for them with a the laying on of hands. The little things, you know, they didn't know what she was doing. They were too little to understand, and there was no need of telling anybody. But if one was upset, she would hold it in her arms, you know, and put her hands upon the child and pat the child and stroke the child and use prayer with a laying on of hands. And her class improved so much that the school principal came to her, What are you doing? What is this? Never seen anything like that. Oh, don't you see? If all we seek the Holy Spirit for is just for a little experience for ourselves, that's not a big enough motive. It's just not big enough. But if we receive the Holy Spirit in order to do the work of him that sent us, then this Holy Spirit will go through us Without disturbing us, without disrupting our lives, we will not go into any backslidings and nervous breakdowns and whatnot. We will increase steadily in power and in joy. Well, I say steadily. There are always some ups and downs. But we will increase in power and in joy. But better than that, the Holy Spirit will flow through us and help to do the thing that Jesus told us to do, which is to build the kingdom of heaven upon this earth. Let's conclude by saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever.